we would like to call upon Viraf Mehta, advisor, partners in change. Viraf is a social anthropologist by training who has been at the forefront of the CSR field in India since 1988. He was a core contributor to the NVGs and also its update process now. Pawan Mehra, Managing Director, C-Kinetics. Pawan Mehra has been involved in building and scaling several ventures. He's a leader who leverages an innovation to create capital efficiency. He has been a venture capital investor in his early career. And since then, he has been engaged in creating mission-driven businesses. Preeti Daruka, South Asia Representative, Business and Human Rights Resource Center. Preeti has over 20 years of experience working in international human rights, joined the Resource Center in September 2017. She is responsible for research and outreach in South Asia region. She also is the founder and executive director of PWESCR International. Ranu Bhogal, Director, Policy, Research and Campaigns, Oxfam India. Ranu has been working in the development sector for almost 30 years. She has extensive experience on issues related to gender, natural resource management, sustainable development with a special focus on rural development. Hello. Hi, can I be heard at the back? Audible? Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you. I have a request. It's terrible sitting here and seeing so many empty chairs in front. So if people sitting at the back could kindly move ahead, it will be a more intimate interaction. Ranu, I think they're all very, com very comfortable where they are. All right, while, whilst this migration is taking place, yeah? Thank you. Yeah? It'd be even better if we just went forward then and sat around some tables and made one big round table, and wouldn't it? Okay, good evening, everyone. And I know we're at the end of the day, and we've all been given seven, eight minutes to speak and then interact. So I was tasked with saying something in the context of uh, the name of the session, which is Next Steps. So I've been asked to speak about where we are with our updated national guidelines and correspondingly BRR of the future. For those of you who may need a line of background, the last time these national NVGs were crafted, drafted, was in 2009 and 10. That was the period that we were asked to develop the document. And as I, as I been listening to the proceedings today. So much of today is based on the fact of the analysis of the BRR reports. And one of the outcomes of NVG1 was obviously its, its reporting framework and through that the BRR. So that was one clear <coughs> output or outcome of the first time round. I think when we come to an opportunity that we had to redraft these or to update these for the government, we noticed that apart from the usual updating 
taking into account the legislative, international developments, all that is fairly straightforward and wouldn't need much elaboration today. But there are three, four key points, I think, that we would like to share so that audience is in a position to be forewarned of what's likely to be processed this time around and how all of us in different ways and capacities can engage with this instrument. All this time we've been saying NVGs, and, and I heard some discussion about the voluntary and mandatory, but this is not at all the um, way that we see this. The guidelines, if you want to be technical, obviously not hard law, and in that respect, in that limited definition of voluntary, but this time round, there has been in some of the consultations with the ministry and voices in government, there's been almost unanimous uh, agreement that let's drop this V word and just call it the national guidelines. You don't have to stress the fact that something that is not law is voluntary. So I think I'm going to refer to them as national guidelines and maybe when they're shortly in the public domain, you can lend your support to that type of title. When we were updating the guidelines this year, it was a two-person committee, Shankar Venkateshwaran, who at that time heading the Tata Sustainability Group, and myself, we had a clear feedback session with the previous group, and the things that we'd like to share that are distinctly different in our submission to the Ministry of Corporate Affairs are as follows. One, starting with the BRR. Of course, the last time round when we drafted these principles and core elements, you will see by the reporting we have today by SEBI of the 100 and now 500 companies, as you know. First of all, in that latter category, I don't think that this is going to continue to be 100, 500, 750. If we have much leverage with this issue, we are going to push for the next batch to be across all listed companies without fur further graduating it by 200 or 300. But even more ambitious than that was the original t intent of this public disclosure. There is something called the MCA21 platform, which is the registry platform for all companies, all the hundreds of thousands of companies under the Companies Act. And our intent is was to every single company, large or small, to be able to put that data in the public domain all the hundreds and thousands of companies, certainly not listed to the, uh, limited to the listed ones. And this is being discussed more as a technical issue in terms of the space required, but I think it could very well be a reality. If this is the case, then in actually redefining the format of reporting, we are blessed with the efforts of so many people in this room who have taken the trouble to analyze each and every BRR report from the first hundred to this year, the 500, and based on the evidence of this reporting, we have proposed some quite dramatic changes to the reporting format that will, number one, make it easier for small, medium enterprise to report. Number two, will allow leadership companies to go beyond existing questions in one category. Number three, in entirely separating um, well, before separating, in linking very, very clearly the principles, core elements, and the indicators that are being placed in, in the reporting framework and benchmarking those with other reporting frameworks like the GRI, what the OECD guidelines have to say, ISO 26K, et cetera, to strengthen the business case of non-duplication and revalidation of some of those questions. The original question list of about 24 through this modified effort was also to raise it to maybe 75 or 80 questions across the table. We will still not be satisfied if we look at each domain because human rights itself, I can think of 50 questions to ask, but given the limitations that we do have, we think that the nature of the question, not merely yes, no types of questions, all the corrections that we could possibly have made have been improved in this version. So I think that the first good takeaway will be a highly improved uh, reporting framework, both for business in terms of its own learning as it answers them, and in terms of uh, organizations and other stakeholders who are using this information, so both from the point of view of answering them and their usability and their relevance. A modification this time in the supply chain is 
a clear call separating last year, last time round, if you recall, all the questions were directed, the company should or the company must or the company shall. This year they've been separated into what the board should do and what the management should do. Very clearly a differentiation between governance roles and imperatives and what they need to look at and place in their responsibility area and what management need to do. Besides this, I think a notable pillar is the whole way that supply chain issues have been put forward in the guidelines. Last time, even principles have been amended to uh, include this. For those companies that thought the business ended at their factory or in their headquarters, they are reminded through these guidelines that their entire supply chain is under the purview of the coverage of these principles. Taking on from NVG1, I think unique things are happening, ladies and gentlemen. For example, if you wanted the movement on just one pillar that I'm most accustomed to, I will end two minutes more just on this. And a one that's still receiving increasing amount of attention, it has to be human rights. Between the supply chain, disclosure and transparency in human rights really lie the essence of this document because it's not that human rights exist there as one P5. It cross-cuts other principles in a novel way this time, and I think brings to the fore issues of women's rights, children's rights, migrant worker rights, various categories of people relevant to our country. But it positions itself, it continues to do, if we look from the last five years, internationally, as you've heard this morning, the tremendous game-changing legislations, for example, out of the UK, the Modern Slavery Act, etc. You will be pleased to know, for example, that next week there is a meeting scheduled uh, between the Ministry of External Affairs that looks at India's treaty and international obligations vis-a-vis -vis child rights, human rights, and other aspects, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, and the National Human Rights Commission. So, stemming from this type of uh, coalition, we can expect movements on human rights as a part of the national guidelines in the following ways, i.e. that certain processes that hitherto were not even referred to in the guidelines will be referred to this time round. For example, due diligence. Due diligence is a core part of what a company has to do to demonstrate its respect for human rights. So I think that you will see new processes actually outlined in the guidelines in consistence with what companies are being asked to do globally. And our hope will be that the opportunities, both in terms of reporting, both in terms of the governance position, positioning, the supply chain aspect, and a very, very strong rights-based guideline is something that I think will, will help keep business busy for a number of years as it catches up. The last time round, when we put human rights there six years ago, it was a whole month before the UNGPs were released. This is leadership. And this time around, I think, for leadership entities, once again, there are a number of opportunities. But just to end on the fact that whilst I think correctly, NVG1 as a first product was not able to make more changes than were intended at that time beyond reporting, I think NVG2 as positioned in the change circumstances internationally and, interna and domestically, along with a prescription that we will be giving MCA after much dialogue with uh, stakeholders on how to increase uptake, we hope that this time's exercise will be even substantially more fruitful than last time timelines. We are told in a minute a document by the ministry that by March, the month ahead, that these submission that we made to them will be put in the public domain for everybody's uh, comment. I expect May, April, March and April. After that, they will be con consistent, I mean, uh, concurrent with that will be dialogues that the ministry will conduct with stakeholder groups, business and others. And then they will collate those comments, I, I hope in a transparent way, and modify the document and release it, they say, no later than the end of June this year. So we are hopeful that a new prescription by government is very much now in the last part of its journey, and it affords all of us an opportunity to 
engage with it as soon as it's in the public domain. So if small groups of an entity is represented here can get together in platforms on topics that are important to them and put them up to the NCA, I think that type of exercise over the next couple of months will be a very worthwhile one. Thank you. Thanks, Viraf. Um, and I'm so glad to sit next to you and get these updates. I, I think getting these updates firsthand and realizing that uh, something's going to happen as far as, as early as March is exciting. Um, I'll share my comments actually in three buckets. Um, one is uh, really picking off, the, uh, off of what Viraf said in terms of the BRR, but really look at it from an investor perspective. Uh, the second is how are investors thinking about this entire conversation? Um, and I'll sort of provide some lens and context to that. And third is, how do we move forward in this conversation? Which is, again, how do investors begin to link into this conversation? Uh, let me preface this by saying that a lot of the data that I will be sharing shortly is emerging from a piece of work uh, that my firm Seekinetics did with Oxfam and would like to acknowledge Oxfam's leadership uh, as far as driving and steering a lot of this conversation from uh, studying the landscape of investors and how can they be brought into this conversation. So bucket number one is when we reached out to investors and we'd surveyed them and spoken to them about um, what they liked about the Indian landscape, one of the things that emerged is eight out of 10 investors were familiar with the BRR. Um, the second thing that emerged in that conversation was while they're familiar with the BRR, they were not using it as much. And the issue that was uh, holding them back from using it as much was not sufficient quantifiable data. Um, the third piece over there, um, again with respect to the BRR, uh, was needing some mechanisms for which captured a rigor in the accountability of the BRR, uh, which obviously the, the report that was launched earlier today feeds into that. And so there's, there's a need for a conversation that bridges this conversation that's happening here with what investors are seeking. So, uh, and, and the summary of that uh, is, I actually saw the copy of the report lying in the back of the room. Uh, we should make sure it gets into your hands so that uh, as you're as you're continuing these conversations with the MCA, we can we can bring in some of those data points. This one. Yes, that's the one. It's already gotten to the bag. <laughs> you can show it to me later. <laughs> All right. Um, the second bucket of uh, reflections have to do with what are investors thinking and why should they be even involved in this conversation? When I say investors, I'm referring to investors really in, in two categories. One is investors that are making equity investments uh, into listed companies, uh, largely listed companies. And the second is investors that are providing debt, um, are there for lenders to a large extent, uh, who, are, who are lending into the Indian market space. And frankly, from an investor standpoint, it really boils down to how do I measure risk and how do I invest in a profitable venture? Uh, there were some discussions in the previous session about people looking for the business case, and from an investor standpoint, it boils down to a lot of these things make a business case. You are, at the end of the day, investing in a firm that is expected to be sustainable in the long run, and sustainability in the long run is, yes, it's financial sustainability, but that only means you're gonna be financial sus financially sustainable if you have a long-term business proposition. and. Most investors, uh, what are ca called as sustainable and responsible investors, they're typically long-term investors and therefore people who are holding on to your pension funds or your insurance and therefore are holding money not for the short term, therefore not for the three months, six months, but really the, uh, uh, the longer tenure. Uh, let me share a few data points in terms of A, what do these investors think about and B, how much of a role they are beginning to play in the Indian market. These investors are driven primarily by two, uh, two reasons. Um, we had surveyed 130 odd investors who are making these sustainable and responsible investments into the Indian market. 
and they're driven primarily by two reasons. Reason number one is they have a vision or their business strategy is based on having or investing in sustainable ventures. Uh, reason number two is, um, is the they believe that investing in sustainable ventures is a mechanism for them to manage their risk. So between these two, whether it's their, a positive business strategy or a risk mitigation from a mis risk mitigation lens, these two reasons constitute 50% of the re 50%. So we'd ask them reasons. So 50% of them came 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 up with these two as uh, their key reasons of why they're investing in um, sustainable or why they're adopting a sustainable and responsible investment strategy. A lot of these people are driven by whether it's their own investors, whether it's uh, whether it's their mandate of making sure they're they're in it for the long run. Uh, I'm not going to get into that, but this is what it boils down to. The other thing was um, we discovered that as we spoke with the uh, with these investors, is there is a sizable chunk of capital that's being deployed in India. So let me give you a sense of what that entails. Uh, all of the mutual funds in India, uh, every, everybody that you can think of, um, all the funds together combined is roughly about 25, uh, 25 lakh crore rupees. Okay. Um, now the, this investor group that's making this, um, this concerted effort to invest consciously with a positive uh, positive lens of uh, looking at social respons socially responsible and uh, ethical concerns, that constitutes, constitutes about two lakh crore rupees. Right? This is not part of this 20, uh, 23,000, 25,000 lakh crore rupees because 25,000 lakh crore rupees is managed from India. This is largely capital coming from outside that is, uh, that is investing with this mindset. And therefore, these are the guys that are looking at the BRR. These are the guys that are looking at all this information. Um, the Indian investors or the Indian mutual fund managers are just beginning to wake up. Um, I, I know we have, uh, at least we had a round table a few months back where SBI has made a concerted effort in that direction. We've had a few, uh, a few funds that have made a concerted effort in that direction. We're going to see a little bit more of that. And frankly, it's a matter of time before Indian investors also, uh, or Indian fund managers also latch onto the same bandwagon. And why? because their peers globally are doing it. It's becoming I an industry norm. And if they don't do it, uh, uh, you know, they're either going to lag behind. In fact, I shouldn't say they won't do it. I, I think they will have no option but to do it. Um, there was a news literally three or four weeks back where BlackRock, which is one of the largest global funds, they've made a commitment to move towards uh, adopting sustainable and responsible investment strategy as a part of their investment decisions. BlackRock is present in India, uh, so we're going to expect, you know, we will clearly expect those changes to happen uh, relatively soon. And it's a matter of time before we see, we see investors being to play a role. Now the question is, what can we as a group begin to do to feed into that conversation, possibly accelerate that conversation, or even begin to say what kind of a, what kind of a, uh, 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 what, what's, what's needed to foster that conversation. That's where there are three elements that need to, uh, to be worked upon. One is we need to create a dialogue that goes beyond this room, beyond civil society, brings the investors into the same room, brings the business into the same room. I think we've, we've talked about that uh, uh, to quite an extent. Um, interestingly, when we had our conversation in Bombay, when Namit and Timo present, you know, we had a slightly different group. Uh, maybe at that time we should have had, perhaps, uh, we should have found a way to get a little bit more of the uh, civil society group into that room uh, as well to sort of bridge, bridge that gap. But I think there's a, clearly a need to have the dialogue. And India is perhaps one of the few countries in the world which has a very sophisticated capital market, but no platform that has an investment dialogue on sustainable and responsible investing. Every other market across the globe that has a sophisticated financial market has a dialogue. So there's an opportunity to have that dialogue. Two is we need to create increasing depth as far as 
uh, a lot of the reporting is concerned so that investments can be made in a far more sound manner. Uh, the report that was launched earlier today morning creates that concreteness for companies to act on. Uh, how do investors begin to provide the way in on that is is it's part that needs to be brought in. And um, I'm really keen to see how the uh, the 75 questions of new BRR begins to look like because that's clearly uh, uh, something we can take to the investors, get their feedback and, and provide some active input. And the third thing there is, what's the mechanism by which we create robust accountability between the companies that are reporting, um, the actions that are taking place on the ground, and then capital coming in. Um, so a lot of this is, a lot of this is stuff that came driv driven out of this room. A lot of these are things that um, I think we can make into tangible action. And, um, and yeah, I think the, the key, I, I will end by saying here that we had done this landscape of investors about um, six years, five years ago. At that time, the total capital under management that was allocated and devoted to sustainable and responsible investing was half of what it is today. So the number has grown, gone up, but it's, it is still a fraction of where it is or where, where it could go. And I think that's where the opportunity is, and that's where we can really change this conversation into going beyond trickles of capital coming in to actually making it uh, a flood of capital coming in. And that's where the cap topic of uh, the title of that report was drops before the rain. We are hoping it becomes a flood and uh, we're able to influence this uh, dialogue. With that, I will pause and pass it on to you. Thanks so much, Pavan. That was really interesting. And I think on the sideline, we'll talk about sustainability we had a little bit in terms of uh, BRICS and the new development bank and I'll share with you some of the things which it's a different kind of investment but uh, experience but good evening everyone it's a pleasure to be here technically I'm perhaps the last presenter because Ranu shared her role is different um, so a pleasure uh, to close on um, be the closing speaker for such a wonderful um, day we had and such wonderful interaction. Um, the topic given to me is documentation. Um, and before I share some of the things as a way forward on documentation, I first wanted to unpack uh, what from a human rights we mean by documentation and why we attach so much value to documentation. Uh, so yes, we heard the report ha was launched and this wonderful index and the amazing work that has been done, but it is on terms of voluntary disclosure of policies. Uh, the role that documentation now in this particular scenario can play is how you link what is being disclosed by the companies in policy and the ground reality. So that's where we need, like we heard the wonderful case study from the Tea Garden by Anirudh, that's a, a remarkable case of systematic documentation and how that systematic documentation of human rights uh, in terms of a tea garden, a particular case, uh, resulted in bringing pressure to both the company, to investors, uh, and uh, building a case. So documentation is what, like, you know, of course, of facts of uh, ground reality, uh, this becomes a real challenge because, of course, you rely on communities to who become our first-hand evidence uh, or witnesses or um, uh, even victims of a lot of these uh, uh, impacts of business activities as well as, as workers in, in businesses. And so uh, uh, how systematically these documentation, this data is gathered is very important in terms of evidence uh, uh, gathering. And in terms of even measuring that, what the company is claiming uh, on paper in their policy and what the ground reality is. Documentation also becomes a, a tool in, in empowering community because through that documentation process, you are giving voice to a lived reality of people who are impacted by uh, businesses. 
you're also uh, bringing them indirectly into the process of engagement, that you're legitimizing a very marginalized, or it could be an isolated, uh, uh, you know, it might be vast, uh, you know, violations of human rights. Still, those incidences are invisible and don't make it into, uh, uh, you know, highlighted into discourses or get pressure put on the actual businesses in terms of having that conversation till there's a systematic documentation and uh, uh, presentation of that. Uh, so documentation has got that uh, definitely a very important component of it in human rights work. Otherwise, it's all talk, 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 right? Like, you know, the human, human rights is about humans, right? And the human aspect of human rights comes in only if you tell the human story. And that's, again, that brings the, uh, uh, the documentation part or gathering of data, evidence, case studies, both quantitative as well as qualitative important. And um, how to make it, how to do documentations. I've done numerous human rights training and it's very important because, uh, you know, to have that clarity, documentation for what and who's going to do documentation and what's the purpose of it is very important in terms of how it is gathered. Uh, I work with Resource Center and I would really encourage you all to definitely, not as a pitch to sell our website or our work, but as a resource tool to see how, and it is not a documentation which the Resource Center has done, but how the documentations done systematically by civil society and other actors has systematically been uh, uploaded in a digital platform which becomes an important tool for advocacy uh, and presenting uh, evidence. Now, having said all that, uh, there also are challenges and shortcomings in terms of uh, documentation. Now, the challenges, as soon as you do documentation as a human right defender or even, you know, a community worker or, a, you know, a worker in a factory, as soon as you're doing documentation, uh, you may may not may face some risk based on what are you what you are documenting. Uh, there are real challenges. This is where the human right defender work <coughs> comes in. That you are challenging and you're gathering evidence in scenarios, uh, which like we Phil shared in his presentation, we were recently in Agra and visited these uh, very home based shoe making units. And as soon as we were coming. There was all these people who were coming, why are you going, are you doing survey? And there were all these uh, efforts being made to make sure that we are not there to gather evidence. So we just kept saying, no, we are just on a exploration. We just wanted to see as opposed to really gathering uh, evidence. So you can see the, the resistance to uh, getting evidence. And why is that? Why is that when, if at one end, the company is putting down all these policies or saying that in the other end, there's such risk and such resistance uh, uh, to gathering evidence. Then it should, they should think that, okay, this is a good, this is the second part of the actual policy being realized and uh, systematically, they should be doing it themselves. Uh, but if uh, civil society or other groups are doing it, uh, it should be further encouraged or done. That is one challenge. Second is that uh, a lot of documentation uh, is used, of course, it's used to present and make a case, uh, naming and shaming. We heard a lot of that, that we are not saying close down the business or close this down, but to open a door of, for dialogue. So that becomes a tricky, uh, uh, you know, even how you use the data you are gathering in, yes, we want to name and shame, yes, we want to put pressure at the same time, opening that space for that conversation that uh, uh, how reform or change can uh, happen because uh, just closing down a business or closing down a place of work or the business getting up from one city or one country moving to another is not going to work in providing for um, uh, human rights. Um, also, a lot of conversation that we heard today, even what Pavan, you shared, the company, unfortunately, when we talk about human rights, 
reduces it to risk management, but doesn't see their role as a promoter of human rights. Uh, that is gets reduced to do no harm. Like that's the uh, least we can expect, and that comes from their, so their businesses are not harmed. However, as a, a, a important stakeholder in the community, they can play a much bigger role in the overall well-being of the community where they are working and where they are, they, they can provide like, you know, education, health, simple, basic rights and essential services can go a long way. Uh, with terms of like, and I don't mean CSR, just CSR. I mean with a commitment towards uh, human rights. Um, I also look around the room. I know there are a lot of expertise on human rights documentation. So I would stop here and hope others will add the expertise to this way forward uh, process. Thanks. Okay, so I'm conscious of the time, but Namit is very keen that I make a last request to people who are still there in the room, and I can see quite a few of you. If you have any suggestions, any ideas uh, for us, one last chance to add your voice. Otherwise, of course, we'll be in touch with you. Namit, I think people want to call it a day. <laughs> okay. Uh, so a quick uh, summary, and uh, I mean, not really a summary of a fantastic day, which uh, started with Nisha and with Tom uh, giving us the context of, of this work. And now you've heard our three people present here. And I must say that uh, it's a huge amount of work that is proposed. And obviously, uh, this group of people who has put together the index and the forum cannot be taking on all of it. and. Uh, and I really would expect that, you know, I think a lot more kind of voices and initiatives will add power to what we are trying to do. So the work with investors on responsible investing, you of course, Vera, are part of the NBG and the NG uh, version too, uh, and Preeti on documentation. But uh, uh, just a quick thing, uh, I, I think we would definitely like to make the index more robust. We are conscious that there are aspects that need to be covered further. We would like to work closely with, say, women's rights organizations, with disability groups, issues of climate change. We had a panelist who talked about LGBT rights. Um, you know, so, um, and I was talking to a representative from UNICEF who said about child rights. So I, I think as we go along, more and more areas will open up. Probably ki some kind of sub-indexes will be developed because I don't, these nine principles, we still don't cover all nine, uh, and it's, it's a mammoth exercise, but maybe, you know, different bodies could help us to develop different indices and, and provide the required push. The second area is about pushing for change. I think what really came out from presentations today was very clearly, this is the third year, <coughs> technically the fifth year of, you know, putting together this kind of an information, but we don't see much change in the actual practices. And this index also depends on what companies choose to disclose and what they put on their website. So what you talk, uh, Preeti, about ground truth things in some senses and the, the case of the shoemaking uh, value chain, I think if you look at different supply chains, we will find those T, for instance, the presentation we s uh, saw today. Uh, and very clearly, the, the, the concerned people in decision-making spaces want to look the other way. Um, and what Amitabh was saying in the morning that, you know, the regulatory framework is weak. It looks the other way. Uh, and so we'll have to have a combination of continuing this kind of work where knowledge is constantly generated and packaged for different users. And the other piece of work will be to organize the affected communities. I think whether we do it or somebody else does it, but that pressure from bottom for, for the, for FPIC and for, for, uh, more responsible business um, practices, uh, it, it will be required. Of course, dialogues are important, coalitions are important, and, and bringing together all the interested parties. Uh, I liked uh, what um, Rishi said in the morning that it, it's really a supply chain is not a chain. It's like a solar system, and it's interdependent. 
And I think uh, <clears throat> we'll have to identify champions in each kind of those stakeholder groups, you know, from business community, from civil society, from uh, human rights defenders, you know, uh, government, and, and really bring those coalitions and also continue investors and media, and then also then continue to work on ground as well, because I think a two-way process will be required. Um, the, the, uh, the tendency to be minimalist, I think now we are pretty sure that this 2% has become almost the cap. And, and uh, in fact, uh, I was in another uh, release of uh, Philanthropy in India report day before, and what, uh, what they were saying is that, you know, they were earlier companies were doing far more. And now they are sitting back after doing a 2%. And that 2% also is in, um, in areas like education and health and a little bit of this and that. And it's not really addressing affected communities and their concerns very, very uh, concretely. So um, I, I think we have to continue to engage with companies to help them see the gaps. Probably at times they know the gaps, but sometimes they may not also, and then they take action. Um, so all in all, that's what, that's what consumer awareness also came up today. Uh, we, we, as of now, we don't work on that, but I would say investor awareness, consumer awareness, these are also areas that are connected. I think what we said in the morning is linking up different pieces of work, so inequality, the uh, responsible business index, responsible investing, uh, you know, regulatory uh, frameworks being strengthened, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, uh, you know, being influenced to play a more active role. So a lot of pieces need to be put together to make this really work. Otherwise, next year also we'll sit here and say, okay, you know, things have really not moved, maybe a few points up and down, but as uh, Dheeraj was saying in the, or Pradeep was uh, responding to a question in the morning, most places you are below 0.5. So you are really doing very badly. So you know, I think one audience member wanted to know what are the good practice examples from other countries, and we know we could aspire for that. But we are doing so badly that there is still a long way to go. And um, thanks a lot to all the panelists. I have a list of people to thank. Um, so bear with me. So all the speakers, thanks a lot to all the speakers and panelists, all of you, the guests who have left and the guests who have stayed back. Um, the Index Expert Committee, the IRBF Advisory Panel, the CRW members, Team Praxis, Teams Partner in Change, colleagues at Oxfam, uh, Team Showbiz and Absolute Travels, the staff at Park Hotel, and Vandana, who's doing the documentation of the day, and Kostab, who I'm told is developing doodles of the day. So I'm looking forward to seeing the doodles, and I'm sure we'll be sharing, oh, that's you, okay. So thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great evening and hope to see you soon.